folks. Am I up? I want to welcome you to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I've got a Cindy Romine, Romy, Romine. Uh, as our presenter today, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, she also some, has books available, and those are for sale on the back table. We have some upcoming programs. Thanks to uh, Commissioner John Leeper, we've got uh, uh, a lady named uh, Betty Parmarino coming, and she's going to discuss the Washington County Fairgrounds Veterans Memorial. On December 16th, we also have uh, Bully Commissioner Brad Avakian coming. On the 23rd and 30th, we will not convene and respect the holidays. Next month, or excuse me, in January, we'll have the Westside Cultural Alliance on the 20th. And I'd like to remind you that we do have a, uh, a website, WashingtonCountyForum.org. We also have a Facebook page and a Facebook group you can link off of, off of our website, and a Twitter account. The Twitter handle is at Washington County Forum. With that being said, I'd like to have you put your hands together and welcome our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad to be here today. I'm Cindy, and I rescue kids from sex trafficking. And I run an organization named Called to Rescue. So I have um, cards and brochures for you if you want any information after we're done today. But I just wanted to uh, let you know that I've been doing this for 25 years. And so, you know, somebody said, have we had this problem that long? Actually, we've had this problem probably for... Uh, since men and, was, men and women were alive. So it's not a new problem, but it is a new twist on the problem. I first uh, ran into the problem. It was a horrible experience, actually. I was on a boat, a little tiny canoe outrigger, going up a river in a foreign country. And on the side, the bank of the river, I saw a uh, Caucasian man buy a little girl from her mother and father. And then I watched him um, play with her for a few minutes, and then I watched him uh, rape her. There wasn't anything I could do because my boat was traveling one way, they were stationary. But that really did change my life. That whole story is in my book. Uh, my book is made up of stories of survivors who are the most wonderful people in the entire world. So there are some, some things that we assume about uh, sex trafficking. One of the things we assume is that everybody that is involved in it, any girl taken in it, is from uh, a poor situation, poor family or street family. That's not true at all. Uh, I was in having my back adjusted by the chiropractor a couple of months ago, and I, he said, well, how's everything going? And I said, well, you know, I rescued a girl, you know, in Vancouver just the other day, and he said, um, my daughter was sex trafficked. That wasn't her I rescued, but he, he had had his daughter sex trafficked. Um, there are 1.2 million children worldwide trafficked every year. 1.2 million children worldwide every year. 150,000 in the United States of America. So when you ask me, you know, does it happen in Washington County, I have to say, of course it does. Of course it does. We're maybe not, we don't have the clues to say, okay, that's what that is. We don't have the background or the, the awareness to know what that is. But, but it happens all the time. I was uh, down on the streets in Portland. My re last rescue was off uh, the streets in Portland. I rescue kids nationwide. But this was a little girl who came from a very wealthy family. She uh, was coerced and taken when she was 16 years old. She's now 19 years old. We do have a house for girls over 18. And so we rescue any age. We don't care. But we kind of focus in on minors. But we do rescue kids of any age. So she's just 19. She's, she's really still a baby. And uh, so she said, called me, she got my number from my hotline number, and she said, um, you know, I want to talk to you about getting off the streets. And so I'm very careful, obviously, because I don't know if it's a setup, if we've got pimps watching or what's going on. And so I have a bodyguard that went into Starbucks before me, bought coffee, was sitting there. And then one of my uh, assistants, who's, we're all trained in Krav Maga, Israeli martial arts. Just want to say, don't mess with grandma, all right. <laughs> 
And so we're, you know, we're pretty streetwise. And so anyway, we sat down and we talked to her for about an hour and a half. And then I said, we'll be back to pick you up tomorrow morning. So people would say, now, why did you not take her off the street right then and there? And that is because you don't know if it's a setup. And if they really want out, they're still going to want out in the morning. And so she was. She wanted out. She was all packed up, ready to go. We took her to our safe house in Eugene. And I'm happy to say she's doing really well. So that's kind of how that goes. I uh, walk people through all kinds of rescues just by telephone and text. Uh, I work with the local, all the local police authorities, FBI, ICE, um, Homeland Security. We all work together to get every child rescued that we possibly can. And you can imagine, I do this, you know, I, I do it for the child, of course, but I also do it for the parent. I mean, if you can imagine going to bed one night and not knowing where your child or your grandchild is, it's unthinkable. And I have just as many calls from grandparents as I do parents. My grandma, my granddaughter's missing, and what do we do? And I had to do a stakeout in Seattle, and so grandpa's the one that did it for me. He went in and did the stakeout for me. So when your child's gone, when your neighbor's child's gone, when somebody's gone that you know, it's imperative that we know immediately. So the police will say what they need is eyes and ears on the ground. That's all of us, eyes and ears on the ground. If you think something's wrong, that you're seeing that something is really wrong, dial 911. Say, it, this is not a life-threatening emergency, but I think I need to report this. You know, the police keep track of all that, and they keep all that in their records, and it could help a case they're working on. What you don't want to do is plow into a situation and wreck somebody that's on a stakeout, right? So you have to be careful not to become the Lone Ranger. We do have task forces all over the United States that are trained uh, to be eyes and ears, and they, uh, you know, will get a, like we just had a missing person from Bend, Oregon last night. She's 22, but she's a woman missing. And so we have task forces in Bend and Terrebonne and all kinds of places over there. They're all on alert. Flyers go out. If they find something, they dial 911. So it's pretty easy. Now, how do you keep your kids safe? Well, we have, you know, a situation that's very different than when we were all kids, and that's called the Internet. And so we need to make sure our kids and grandkids, what they're doing on their Facebook. Facebook is a very wonderful, I mean, for me, it's fabulous. Because I can put a person's you know, picture out or kid's name out, and it goes worldwide. I can go around the world. I have. I've gone around the world on Facebook within an hour. So we can track kids all over the world within one hour. But also, the predators can come after your grandkids, your kids, in just about the same amount of time. And so what, what we do that's really amazing, it amazes me how people do this. We have our kids' school pictures on Facebook, and it says what school they're at. I mean, it's pretty easy to track a kid anywhere in the United States. If you want to track a kid, you can find a kid. And, they, and the kids like the number, right? So I don't, you know, I don't know how many of you are really into Facebook, but you know, the fa how, many num how many friends do you have on Facebook? Well, I have 1,000. I have 1,500 friends on Facebook. Well, how many of them do you know? Four, you know. So you have to kind of go back and you have to sit down with them and say, how well do you know this guy? Right. And so and then delete, delete, delete. So if parents and grandparents, you know, the holidays are coming up. If you're with your kids and grandkids, sit down with them, go through Facebook and, and just say, don't talk to people you don't know. Now, if that was the whole answer, that would be easy. But the truth is, and we all know this, that most of the molestation that happens to our children and grandchildren are by friends, teachers, and people who have access to our kids. So if your kids are molested, it's going to be somebody you know. It, that's very disturbing, I know. But guess what? When you, you're coming up to Thanksgiving, you're going to have all the adults at one table, all the kids at another table. The kids get done within three and a half minutes, and they're off in the back bedroom, right? Or, am I right? Come on. All right. And they're unsupervised. So we have a whole room of children unsupervised. I would say, please, 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 don't set the table like that. Include your kids. 
put grandma and grandpa and kids and kids and kids and 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 enjoy each other and don't let them be in the back room by themselves. The computer needs to never be in a kid's bedroom, never be in a child's bedroom. I, most of my counseling with young men is done because they started doing pornography when they were 11, 12 years old. So if you think your kids are going to bed at night and then you go to bed and they're staying in bed, you're wrong. They're getting back up. They're getting back on the computer and then they can do whatever they want to do on the computer. Well, and of course now we have the iPhone, so we have that problem too because they have internet 24-7. So I have all kinds of tips on that too. So what are we going to do about our problem here in the greater Portland metro area and more importantly Washington County? We need to make sure we are on top of what's going on in our own community. You know you have a strip in Beaverton, right, that's very dangerous. Come on, people, at least wave your head yes, right? You do know you have a strip there. Yes? All right, some of you know, some of you are going, Beaverton, oh no, not in our area. But you do, you have huge problems in your own area. And, and those problems escalate. And so uh, there is no such thing as a girl that is not vulnerable who's working in a strip club. If you have a girl that's in a strip club, she is vulnerable and she's on her way to having a man manager, a pimp manage her. So we need to get our kids, we need to know, not be naive about what goes on. This is a hard topic. People don't like to talk about it. People don't want to know about it. And that's why we have the big problem. Because nobody wants to talk about it and nobody wants to know about it. And nobody wants to think it's happening in your area. And more importantly, nobody wants to think it could be happening into your own grandchildren and children. So how does your child, your grandchild, get involved in this and how would they be taken? The mall. Everybody thinks that the mall is a babysitter. They drop their kids off at the mall. Two is not a group. Two is not a group. Two kids alone at the mall are just as vulnerable as, uh, as, you know, as one is. So make sure we have a larger group than that. The average age of a child taken in sex trafficking in the U.S. is 13 years old. So if you think I should be in high schools, you're wrong. I need to be in junior highs. And people that have kids that are in junior high need to really understand that if you wait to talk about the birds and the bees until they're a freshman in high school, you're way behind the times. They're going to be going, oh, mom, I can teach you about this, right? Because they start educa sex education in the schools very early. So this is a normal topic for them. They, you drop them off at the mall, the girls uh, are walking along, and this uh, very well-trained, most of the time, looks very normal guy comes up and he starts telling her how beautiful she is or that he has a modeling agency and he'd like to get her involved in that and they sit down and they have a coca-cola the police say that a girl can sit down in the food court and three hours later be on the streets and they are right and they are right so what, you know, my poor granddaughter is 16. Can you imagine having me for your grandmother? Right? And so she's like, yeah. So she's like, ah, but she's also taking Krav Maga. I mean, she can defend herself. Ladies, learn how to defend yourself. One out of six, uh, one out of every six women in the United States will be assaulted. One out of six will be assaulted. It's just fact. One out of four girls at a university level stay... Uh, going to a university will be raped, one out of four. So this is not a time to slack off in how we get uh, start defending ourselves. So anyway, my granddaughter, when she goes to the mall, my son, bless his heart, will go and he'll say, "I'll be, I'll be 50 feet behind you. I'll be, you know, 100 yards back, uh, but I will be here. You guys go have a good time of your life. You're not going to see me. I'm not going to come up and talk to you. You're on your own, but I will be here." Now, when your kids hit 15 and 16, just go to the mall, sit in the food court, and have them walk by or text you as they walk by. I'm walking by the food court. Mom, don't look at me. You know, that kind of thing. And so that they, you are keeping your eye on those girls and those kids uh, all the time. 
one of the most shocking things uh, that I ran into when, you know, I started all this is that 50% of all pimps are women. 50% of all pimps are women. So it's much easier for a woman to coerce a girl because a woman, you feel, a woman feels safer with a woman. So, I mean, so we've got that going on. And, oh, you know, I'm a hairstylist, and why don't you just come to the beauty shop, and I can just restyle your hair. And these, you know, 13, you know, you're talking about, you know, people say things to me like, well, why, why don't they just, you know, get away? What? You know, women who are caught in domestic violence can't get away. Why are we thinking that a 13-year-old can get away? Why do we think a 13-year-old can outthink people if a woman, a grown woman, can't outthink people? So we need to give the kids a break, say, yeah, they were coerced. They're stuck in sex trafficking. Most of my girls have been in, once they're in, they're stuck in sex trafficking on an average of about three or four years, just till they get old enough to figure out they don't have to do it. Uh, I have girls that I've rescued that have been two months. I have girls that I've rescued that have been in 12 years. And after working with them for a long time, I'm thinking, and I don't have any clear statistics on this, but I think it takes five years of recovery for every year they're in. And I'm not sure they ever really are completely recovered because it's such, the stories are so horrific. I mean, you would all be weeping and crying if I started getting into uh, all the stories. So the youngest child I've, uh, I've rescued is eight years old. And um, I have a huge organization also in the Philippines. So we have, we have a big organization over there. And I had two little sisters, 12 and eight. And they had to come from a, a far distance into the police department in Manila. And so I was meeting with them. And we were all meeting in a restaurant to keep them more relaxed. So I was one of the first ones there. And you know, I said, well, what would you, what would you girls like to you know, What do you want to eat? You know, and they, they both chose chocolate ice cream. And they were sitting there. And I'm telling you, this was one of the hardest things I have ever done in my life. Because I just sat there and thought, kids are made for chocolate ice cream. Kids are made for chocolate ice cream. I wanted to stand on the table in the restaurant and scream, kids are made for chocolate ice cream. Not to be hurt. Not to be hurt. But the 12-year-old had been being raped re repeatedly every day for two years. And then when he got tired of her, he went after the younger sister, and she just, she said, no, you're not doing that to my sister. And she went and told her mom and dad everything, and she was still in her own home. We have parents. I mean, it's so shocking because, you know, I, I spoke one day, and I, I mentioned that 150,000 of our children are trafficked in the United States every year. And this young lady came up to me afterwards, and she was crying, and she said, I hate the number 150,000. And I said, I know it's a big number. She said, no, I hate it because I'm not counted. I said, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, you know, and she said, my mom was a drug addict. She sold all four of us. She, she was our pimp. She trafficked all four of us. So our statistics are, are kind of whacked out, and we don't have accurate statistics, but we know atrocities go on every single day in our own cities, in Washington County, you have as big a problem as any other little burg in the United States of America. I mean, this happens all over. It's not like it's just here or there. It is everywhere. We have well-trained pimps who are going after our kids and making a lot of money. Each pimp makes approximately $100,000 per year, tax-free, I might add, for every girl that they run. $100,000. It's a $32 billion industry. It is only second in criminal activity to drugs. And when I'm a drug runner, I can run a drug and I'm out of drugs. When I have a child, I can run them 20 to 30 times a day, seven days a week. So the money-making thing is going to far out surpass it. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but we just brought down, not we, not me personally, but 
the law enforcement just brought down over 450 uh, guys in pornography worldwide, and the head of it was in Canada. I mean, those that stuff makes my day, right? So um, I've given you a huge overview, and you're probably all, is everybody breathing? Is everybody okay out there? You know, it's quite a heavy topic. Um, but I'll tell you, one kid, one, rescuing one, rescuing one is worth everything I do. And it's just, you know, I, I did the largest manhunt in the Philippines using all of the Department of Justice and the Philippine National Police. And we rescued a 14-year-old. The moment I live for. You know, they were at a mall. The pimp thought he could drop her off and it would be fine. And he could, actually it was a woman, she could sneak out. And so she takes her to the mall. Mom's there, of course, everybody's there in plain clothes. I mean, I have plain clothes guys everywhere. And uh, the moment is when she gets away and mom sees her and they run toward each other. It will last me a lifetime because mom doesn't have to go to bed and wonder where her kid is one more night. She was only gone seven days and we got her back. The sooner we know, the faster we can get them back. So I'm sure you have some questions. So I'm gonna open it up for questions and here we go. Yes, ma'am. We do rescue boys, and I have boy survivors. The question was, in case everybody didn't hear, are boys involved? Uh, absolutely. 30% are boys. It's, a, a, I think, a larger percent than most of us think. And so 30% are boys, 70% are girls. And, yes, we do take care of our boys. And, um, you know, the whole thing is just such an atrocity. So, anyway, we take care of all of our kids. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Bill Kroger. I'm Hi. a forum member. Thank you for coming in today. I know, I know coming, coming out, out of prison, prison, for example, of uh, uh, drug addicts and alcoholics, uh, uh, the best thing for them is to have housing and then a job and a support network, AA or NA or something like that. Yes. I assume, I assume with, the, with, with some, some of the women, women you're talking about that this is probably similar. similar. So, so I was wondering, wondering if you maybe talk, talk about the after The recovery. Yeah. Yeah. The recovery is huge, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, because, I, you know, I rescue... Um, I rescue three or four uh, a week, and then, of course, we have recovery for all of those. And, and every girl is completely different. The, one of the bigger differences is whether the child is a minor or whether the child is as an adult. So if a child is a minor, the child either goes back to parents who really love and care for them, that's the best scenario, or they go back into the system, which is a very difficult scenario. Um, but then the system takes care of them, and we're not involved in that recovery. If mom and dad take care of them, we can then recommend counseling and, and get them back on the right trail. If it's an adult girl over 18, uh, we, are, we are fully set up in our safe house. And so we do, but it's labor intensive, just like you say. They've got to go into a safe place. They've got to find a job. Well, most of these kids were taken at 13. They don't even have an education. So, and where are we going to find a job that can pay what they're making? That is one of our biggest problems. I mean, they're making five or $600 a night on the low end of things. One of my girls made $5,000 a night. So what is she going to do? Come out and work for McDonald's. You know, it doesn't work. And she has no education and no training. But she's solid. She's got her job. We've got her in her own apartment now. But it has taken us four years to get her to that point. So yes, Bill, you're right. It takes a long time. Hi. Chris, a former member. There, there were some, some kidnappings in Texas on a border town. Yes. Have you had any, I read in your biography, you were in Mexico too. Yes. So do you have any information on those two girls that were recently kidnapped? I don't on the two that were recently kidnapped, Chris. I don't have information on them. But I do have new information out of Phoenix that says that Phoenix is the largest, has the largest populations of kidnapping of any city in the United States 
because of its locality to Mexico. So hang on to your babies if they're in the, you know, on the border area. Okay. But I have rescued girls out of Mexico. It's shocking. See, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girls. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Bruce Barlow, former member. member. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank, thank you for, you for coming, coming and being able to name this subject and speaking to it as directly as you are. Um, it, is, it is quite um, an honor to have somebody who's put this much time and heart energy into doing this work come and speak to us, and, and you're brave for doing it. I appreciate it very much. Um, I uh, had an experience picking up what I thought was a strand motorist, and it turned out on the Fremont Bridge, and it turned out to be a young woman who was in sex trade. Um, it felt like kind of like a setup. I had a little dog with me who sat on her lap as I drove her off the bridge, and she came more into herself, and it was clear to me um, that she was autistic. And I'm wondering if, since we're having such an incredible expansion of the autistic spectrum population, if you're seeing children who are autistic more likely to be drawn into the sex trade. Absolutely. Any child that has any kind of handicap whatsoever, even just a learning handicap, for one thing, um, our society does not treat them well, and the, and the kids at school don't treat them well. And so they kind of have a poor self-image, and so they kind of walk, you know, kind of down, and they're number one targets, number one targets. And we do have a lot of girls in our program uh, that are exactly that way. Beautiful little girls. Um, Go ahead. I was trying to recall. Um, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have, have a special, special, how do you, you deal, deal then with the autism uh, in the recovery? Usually, usually there is a parent involved with autistic kids that we go back to. In our situation, we have been fortunate enough to have parents involved. And so then we have to go through, but it takes a whole different healing process just because of their understanding. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, and then, uh, can I say that, I'm just gonna be very blunt, we're all adults here. Um, it has developed an appetite in them that is not natural, and so they think that's natural because they can't really rationalize properly. And so we do continual, continually have problems with this. Um, who, are who are your allies in doing this work? What organizations? organizations uh, you, you mentioned law enforcement. enforcement. What, what about, about public, public services? services? The, the county, county public, public health? Uh, absolutely. We network with everybody. But you have to remember, I rescue all over the U.S., so it's, it's all over. I mean, all of the services all over the United States, I'm getting in touch with people. But there are a network of people who do nothing but rescue kids, so we also network with them. Of course, I live in Vancouver, Washington, and Linda Smith is there with Shared Hope, and she does legislation. Thank God. We need people to do change laws, get legislation. Why are we letting sex offenders out after a year? Can I just ask that? They just go back and do it again. They're not rehabilitated, most of them, and we need a better program for rehabilitation on that. Anybody else believe that is true? Yes. Well, that's true. Bill and I both serve on the Behavioral Health Council here in Washington County, and sex offenders are difficult treatment. There are yes. no modalities of treatment, and so the human capacity of redemption needs to be honored in yes. that. Um, but it, it, it takes special management. Thank you for your answer. Yes, it does take special management, absolutely. Let's talk, let's talk about the money. money. Okay, okay, John, let's, let's talk, talk about, about that. <laughs> what, what does the uh, customer have to, to lose if one, one girl is taken off, off the street and then is replaced by another? Uh, time and, and money, right? So if I rescue a girl that he has already trained and gotten into the program. No, I don't mean the okay. pain. I mean, I mean the, the customer that are paying all the bills. All the, the, the Johns, John, 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 even, even though that's, that's my given, given name. name. <laughs> we know the funny, difference, John. Anyway, we do yeah. know the difference. All right. What yeah. happens to them? Do you have any conviction rate, rate uh, of any respectable number? number? The conviction rate in every area is different, right? Be and how long they get depends on the law in the state of where they're arrested. And it just goes on and on and on. I, of course, believe that the, we should have a, a more solid um, 
I would love to see a John school in every county in, in the United States, a John school. Uh, Multnomah County has one. We're working on one in Vancouver. Washington County needs one. What is a John school? A John school is a guy comes in, he has, you know, hired somebody, he's been caught. And so now we need to uh, do something for recovery. A John school actually says, okay, you can go to jail for a few days or you can just go to the John school. And we charge them a lot of money. We bring in doctors, survivors, we educate them on what they're really doing. And the statistics on that are quite good of repeats. So that's kind of what one of the things that we, we like to see happen is the John School. Eric. Eric Squires, Squires for my member. You're, you're starting, starting to touch, touch on my question, question right now with John School. school. Could, Could you tell me from your experience, experience what is effective at reducing the demand side of the equation? equation. So uh, reducing the incentive for Johns, reducing the incentive for Pimps, uh, so, so that, that, that supply side answer the answer to the question, what can we do to get rid of the demand? demand? Haven't we always had the demand? Uh, the, the John School, I think, is one of our best situations. They used to be able, if a man was caught, you know, arrested, they could actually put his name out and put it on the Internet. That's a, that keeps them, away, you know, from doing, uh, uh, buying on the street. That keeps them from buying on the street. It doesn't keep them from the problem we now have with buying over the internet. Because you can go on the internet and there is a menu. How tall, how much do they weigh, uh, cup size, uh, color of hair, how old, what ethnic uh, you know, background do they have. So you can actually order online and have them come to your home. So then now that is a kicker because nobody's going to probably catch that for a long, long time unless we go, do everything undercover. And they do that, of course. FBI and the police do that, is they pretend they're a, a John and they go and they do all that. But can you imagine the amount of time that would take to catch everybody? It's, it's phenomenally bad. So I didn't think I answered that really at all for you, Eric. If there was a really good answer, we probably would have already tackled most of it. So. Sorry. Yes, Chris. Yes, yes Doctor. Uh, to me, uh, with the legalizing of marijuana, I'm wondering about the legalizing of prostitution and your view on that. How many reasons are you for it or against it? Oh, brother. I didn't know he was there. You guys are going to put me on the spot like this. Actually, um, I like Sweden's approach. Sweden's approach is they heavily fine the buyer and the girl. And so there's a hurt on the pimp side because the pimp has to pay the girl's fine. And there's a hurt on the buyer's side because it's a phenomenal amount of money. I mean, if you buy a child, can we just talk for a minute? If you're an adult, do what you want. But when you start buying a minor child, I'm telling you, that fine should be huge, in my estimation, and that would slow it down. If the women were old enough, would they be uh, able to practice prostitution in your view? If they're old enough, there's not anything I personally can do about it because they, they fall into the adult category. So in my, you know, in my dealing with all this, I had to come to grips with you know, I'm, I can't take on the whole idea of all prostitution in the world, but I am going to take on defending minors. And so that's kind of, but I rescue everybody, right? So. If it was legalized for the older adults, would that uh, take the pressure off the children? No, it would not. And I think this is an interesting fact. Almost every girl that I have rescued that has had been arrested said being arrested was the best thing that ever happened for them because they're actually away from the pimp and can make a decision. You know, they're away for like maybe 24 whole hours or 48. All of a sudden they come to their senses, the drugs are leaving their body and they're going, I'm not going back to this. So most of them have said to me, getting arrested was actually great. 
Would you uh, also say that 90% of the problem is the family forcing the child? 90, no, I wouldn't say 90% is. I would say it's closer to 30% is family directed and 70% is coercion by pimps. Good information. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I got one more. Okay. Is everybody okay? You still breathing out there? <laughs> it's a somber topic. It's a somber Let, let's topic. Let them absorb it. Yeah. Um, Cindy, a great presentation so far. When you were uh, discussing uh, Chris's answer, or Chris's question, um, you triggered some metrics. And I'm wondering if you can share economic metrics. One I'd like to put out there for the premise of my question is this, is that you know, over the course of a lifetime, a human being in the United States might earn a half a million, a million, a million and a half dollars. When you take um, this victim set and you pull it out of the real economy and you put it into the criminal economy, can you tell me what sort of numbers you've come across in terms of you know, how much more we pay for police, how much lost income that this person who's got to start from scratch and go back to school loses? Do you have any hard metric math that, uh, I don't that have you can hard share metric with math. me? I'll tell you, my ma metric math is really bad, Eric. Okay. <laughs> but it has to be a phenomenal amount of money because I'm taking a 13-year-old who has never been educated and having to make sure they still get their GED and or be trained in something besides high school to be able to make a living. I mean, just what I, I figure it costs me personally, you know, our organization, three to $5,000 per girl, depending on how long they've been out there, to get them at least grounded. Not even making money yet, but at least grounded and starting to be going through the healing process. It's a phenomenal money waster as far as the girl's concerned. The pimp's making great money. Could you tell me about infrastructure that's needed once the, uh, uh, the victim is removed from the scenario? So what do we need? Do we need safe houses? Mm -hmm. Do we need um, uh, counseling? Can you t talk a little bit about yeah. the infrastructure mm -hmm. to keep this person out of that uh, scenario? So right now, Janice program downtown Portland has uh, room, I think, for six or eight kids, boys and or girls, and they do mix them together, and they can't hold them. You cannot, this is, it, because of the law, you can't hold somebody, right? If I hold a minor or, or an adult, I'm the trafficker, right? So I can't hold them while they're getting healed. They actually have to be willing to stay with us to go through the process, and that in itself is huge. So there's, that's problematic. Um, they can, of course, be held if they're arrested. The court can put them in a situation where they can be held and go through counseling. They need extensive counseling the minute, the minute we get them because what we're actually doing is taking them from one culture to another culture. So that is the, its own separate culture, and they've been integrated into that culture. Most pimps want the girl to have their baby, to also hold them to them. So we've got, when we get into adult women, we've got kids belonging to all of these different guys, and so we have that to consider, and mom's gotta be able to work and do, take care of the kids. It's a phenomenal burden. It's a phenomenal financial burden. But I'd be happy to work with you on a math matrix. That would be interesting. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, board member. Uh, we've had in Oregon, of course, the Child Abuse Reporting Act for yes. some years now that requires oh, health care professionals, lawyers, and others to report incidents that they observe which are child abuse or what mm -hmm. they think are child abuse. Have you any comment on the effectiveness of that law in terms of what you're doing and if such legislation, you know, should be adopted elsewhere? I absolutely think it should be adopted elsewhere. Anytime we can have everybody that has eyes and ears have mandatory reporting, we've got a great situation. Because if we didn't have mandatory reporting, you know, your emotions can get involved in it. Well, I knew that coach and he was a nice guy. She was a nice woman, doesn't have to be a man. You know, and so we can, we can kind of mentally maybe not go to the police with that or we don't want to get people in trouble. 
I say let the police sort it out. We need mandatory reporting. Mandatory reporting is one of the best things that ever happened for our kids, uh, just from my uh, viewpoint. Yeah, Bruce Bartlett, former member. Um, it makes me think, uh, you, you mentioned arrest. There's a huge difference between arrest and conviction. Yes. And it's very easy to fling a charge, especially in this state where somebody accused of something has to be arrested, um, to actually being convicted of that same crime. Yes. And so in some of my experience, the first person to declare the assault wins the, b the battle because the other person is defending. So it can right. be used tactically um, uh, you know, in reverse uh, <laughs> ethical order. Right. Um, and so could you speak a little bit about the advantages of tracking conviction records rather than reporting arrests? I think both are very, very important because if you are arrested for something, it, it does put the fear of God in you. Uh, but I love true. Yeah, but I love the arrest part because it does take it to a whole different level, and then there has to be some prosecution going on. True, but if charges are dismissed, you know, then the arrest is there. And mugshots.com is an interesting phenomena, which it is an interesting. So it, this phenomenon. is actually more of a comment for the larger audience that that we have a justice system in which justice is sort of an afterthought yeah, we, sometimes. Yeah, we could use some revision. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, and um, I'm assuming and hoping at least that you were able to watch 60 Minutes last night. I um, did not see it. What one was one it? One of the segments of 60 Minutes was um, talking about a new program of rehab for some of our veterans with PTSD. Oh, good, yes. And, the, and some of the rehab programs they're using are the same programs they have been using to help victims of rape and sexual violence. That's correct. And so, considering how many much publicized problems in the military with rape and um, inappropriate sexual conduct, and now PTSD veterans yes. are acknowledging that that's helpful, I'd like to hope that one of the things that will come about that that perhaps could affect Child trafficking mm -hmm. is just an acceptance in this country that we have never dealt with victims of sexual That's abuse, period, mm -hmm. at, in any form. In any form. Right, That's right, including high school complaints and yes. so forth and so on. So perhaps, if nothing, the, the uh, collision of different forms of society coming at once may help us at least I hope bring so, more because legislation. Our girls are have that same trauma, absolutely. Yes, mm -hmm. which I'm assuming complicated by youngsters that are going to have a difficult time anyway. Absolutely. And an age variance and lack of education certainly mm -hmm. makes that complicated. Mm -hmm. okay. Moms and dads are absolutely necessary in this recovery of the adults and the kids. Right. If a mom and dad will be proactive, we have, we have hope. Do you have circumstances where parents just kind of wash their hands of the whole situation and don't want to deal with this rescued We don't member? have that because most of the time they're calling me, right? Okay. But what we have is we have kids that are in the foster system, ah. right, without parents that are pursuing them and making sure they're safe. And so then can the advocacy program step in and help those youngsters? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, John Bell, former member. We have a Jean's place. You said there are only six people there. Is that? Or that? I thought that was an adult level. Janice program. No, Jean's place. Jean's place. I don't. I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Does Janice? anybody know Jean's place? If it's adult. Maybe the what? Yeah, it's, it's Jean just. Masters? Yeah, Jean I don't I, know that program. Maybe. Uh, Maybe I get the name wrong, mm -hmm. but uh, when I hear the number six or eight people, that is a very small number. Of it seems like a small number. number for a for placement because. Mm -hmm. uh, what we really need is we oh, need a hundred houses that will hold six or eight. Yeah. Because if you get traumatized kids together, 
you have to be careful who you put together, what personalities, what kind of trauma they've gone through. And really, eight girls that have all been sexually traumatized is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. A lot of work. I wouldn't recommend a place bigger than eight, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are stages, right? We have a, a, an intake, and now we're hoping that we'll get develop, be able to develop some kind of a, a farm, ranch, something where, you know, they go through the first phase and then they can get to the second and third because that's what it really is going to take to get them trained mm -hmm. and educated. Yeah, with six or eight people, that's... Uh, Drop mm -hmm. in the bucket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wonder the, how they, because once they're used to the income and, and they've probably already been out of the home yes. or the home has been dissolved, uh, drug use or something, like that. so they're not part of that home anymore. Nope. So you're going to have to have a substitute parent. Yeah, you do. Uh, safe home mm -hmm. where they can, you know, and then it takes, probably takes a period of time to uh, recuperate before they get started in the, exactly. to the um, Really, really, bit, really, bit, really, bit meditation. So you got. I can see a couple of years. That, oh yeah. Uh, that they have to be in under care, whether when they're not, and then they're not able to t take financially pay for their home. Exactly. And then all so that time you got to ask train huge people. Huge financial and problem. Yeah, too. Mm -hmm. So. No easy answer. I know uh, Thailand is supposed to have a million prostitutes, mm -hmm. and almost all the kids from the, in the farm areas come into Bangkok yeah. are all. Yeah, I work in Burma on the border up at the Thai north th part of Thailand, and every they say every kid that comes across that border is going to be trafficked. Yeah. Yeah, because and we actually have 13 safe houses inside Burma. Uh, beca full of tribe kids because uh, their parents don't want them taken, so they give them to us, and we have the right kind of protection for them. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Cheryl Hoy. It sounds like a lot of your um, your work is in the rescue side of things, it is. and what you talked a little bit about uh, maybe prevention with tougher laws, tougher penalties. Do you do some work as well in prevention? One thing that comes to my mind is going into like the middle schools and talking with classes. I do, and I love Great. those kids. Yeah. <laughs> I actually incorporate self-defense with it when I talk to them, at, so they're active also, and it kind of. Well, obviously, it isn't the presentation that you got today, right? Because uh, they're kids, so. But we do talk about keeping yourself safe and staying out of trouble. Any last questions? Lynn, how about a round of applause? Thank you, first? Eric. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it. Folks, just a quick reminder, we're going to have Betty Pomeroy. I want to thank uh, John Leeper for making the suggestion. Uh, Betty Pomeroy is going to speak on the Washington County Fairgrounds Veterans Memorial next week. And uh, I do want to remind you to make sure you are here for December 16th's program where we've got another statewide elected bully commissioner, Brad Avakian. I'd like to conclude today's forum program, and thank you for being here. Am I up? Don't forget to buy the book. Cindy's book is on the back for $14.95. Buy a copy, please.